Right now we're located at the uh, Hip Hop Museum at the Sand Gallery. And today I'm joined by my guest, Kimbali Fidel. What's, up? What's going on, my brother? I appreciate you. So um, let's jump right into this thing, man. Like, obviously, you know, we've known each other for some time, but for everybody that isn't familiar with you, um, just tell them a little bit about yourself. Um, so I'm a writer, spoken word poet from East Baltimore. Um, I received my bachelor's degree in English from Virginia State. I'm in a uh, master fine arts program at the University of Baltimore, um, yes, concentrating on um, creative writing. Uh, I mean, that, that's pretty much it for real. You know, I go to, I go to schools, um, I teach writing workshops, so I give lectures. Some teachers put my work in their curriculum, so I might go speak to their students, form poetry, write. That's pretty much what I do. It's a whole lot, man. Yeah. So um, how long is this? How long has this been your thing? How long have you, have you been doing poetry? How long have you been doing spoken word? How long have you been writing? So I first started writing in 2011 when I was at Virginia State. Um, I thought that I hated reading, but I had this English professor named Arnold Westbrook who um, channeled a lot of his English lessons through like African American studies. So it was my first time reading my hands when he makes a use a lot of like, you know, you know, figures in, you know, the black writing world. And I fell in love with reading and then I um, started challenging myself, saying, yo, you should, you know, try writing. And I started writing. And I was sharing with my cousin, Avon, who was going to Virginia Union at the time, like 30 minutes away. My homeboy, Boo Boo, who was in Baltimore, and um, my homeboy, Jelante, who was on campus with me, and they, they, they said that, you know, they love my work. And um, it was at one point that I thought they was lying, like they was just trying to spare my feelings for real. Because, you know, like, people ain't going to just be like, yo, you some shit. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Can I cuss on Yeah. Oh. Well, uh, actually, I don't know it. <laughs> What I'm kind of interested in, though, is, you know, so if I'm following the timeline correctly, you said you really didn't start reading these these authors until you were already in college. 2011, my freshman year. So what was, what was, uh, what were you like as a reader before then? Were you like an avid reader? Were you like somebody that, or was college your first introduction to that? College was my first introduction to reading. I remember my grandma used to read the name when I was little. Like she would read like some Dr. Seuss books and mm -hmm. you know stuff like that, Cat and Hat, all of that. But and um, in high school we was assigned readers. I never used to read. I just used to go and spark notes and get all the details, or I'll um, or I'll cheat off somebody else's paper like if it was time for a test. I think that that's that's something that a lot of us growing up in Baltimore can kind of identify with that story. Cause I was similar. You know, I didn't learn how to read until I was almost out of elementary school, you know what I'm saying? And even through middle school, I found myself not really connected to any of the books that they were giving us. It wasn't really until like high school for me that I started picking up certain books and like, you know, learning about that kind of stuff. And I feel like that, obviously with both of us teaching now, that's something that I think is really dope because now we're in a position where we can, you can show the kids your book, you know what I mean? Like you can show them your videos on, um, on uh, social media and on YouTube and things like that, and they can see an example of what that looks like. Did you have any examples like that growing up? The only example that I had in my life was my aunt Sadiq, my father's sister. Um, as far as, you know, going out of family tradition, like, you know, going to college and like extremely excelling. Mm -hmm. Like, all I know is that she worked for the government. Like, her work is like classified, but I know that she was always the person in the family that if anybody needed any money, it was Sadiq. Anybody needed somewhere to stay, it was Sadiq. And she always stayed in like Northern VA. You know what I'm saying? It was one point in time she was staying out in the county in Baltimore. But like everybody would go to her. So I always knew that I wanted to live comfortably like that, but I never knew what I wanted to do for her. So that was like the only example, you know what I'm saying? Like break out of like the family tradition of just like getting a regular nine to five and making ends meet, you know what I'm saying? Like if you Miss a week of work, you probably, you know, that's legit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like yeah. It was, so yeah, I'll say my mind's a geek. So I'm definitely, um, for one, I'm excited to read um, your newest book, but, you know, obviously um, I've dived into uh, your first two projects, and, you know, those are phenomenal. I've used those as teaching tools for, um, for my kids, kids that I've worked with, you know, um, it's great to see them actually see somebody be that open and that vulnerable, you know, on the page and it kind of allows them um, to feel comfortable doing the same thing. So I definitely appreciate you for that. But tell me a little bit about how 
a kid from East Baltimore, you know, even ends up becoming an author. You know, learn, I mean, starting to read uh, 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 vividly that late and, you know, kind of transitioning uh, more so uh, uh, at, at the age that you did. Mm -hmm. So I would say that one of my biggest tools is that, like one of my, my, my best character traits is that I listen. So um, I don't know what it was, but my English professor, um, my freshman year, but I listened to everything that Joe was able to say, read this and, mm -hmm. and do this. And he would always push me harder than everybody else in the class, and I really didn't understand it, but now I do. So, um, like, I believe that everybody loves reading, and they just haven't found what they love to read yet. They claim they hate reading. That's you get what I'm saying? So, I mean, I don't really know, you know, that's the only thing that I can I can look back to and say that that got me, you know, to where I am today. For so your first book, what was it? What was it that clicked in your mind that said, you know, you were in college at the time? Yeah. Well, so I re so I started working on a book when I was in college, but I released it when I graduated in 2015. Okay. But um. So you were so you were planning this? Yeah. You know. But, but the only reason why I really wanted to initially put out a book was because I was infatuated with um, the idea that books can be on this earth long after we gone. Mm -hmm. Like I done had physical copies of books that been for like a hundred years, like mm -hmm. I touched them, I felt them. And that's what I was like, you know, enthused by. Not even like really being an author. But then when I saw the, uh, you know, the responses that I was getting after I dropped the book, that's what made me want to become like a better writer on the page and a better mm -hmm. author. I wanted to do it, you know what I'm saying? More in a business savvy type of way. So do you feel like you've gotten to that point at, uh, uh, at this point? Yeah, of course. Like Even if you look at my first book, Asper's Artistry, to Raw Wolf, to Hummingbirds in the Trenches, you can see the progression with the writing. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of growth. You can see the progression with um, the editing. You can see progression with um, the connections that I made from Asper's Artistry to Raw Wolf, to Hummingbirds in the Trenches. Even if you look at the people that I got to blur my book, you know what I'm saying? Just, you know. So have you... Um did you self-publish your your projects yeah. or were they? All three of them self-published. Oh, congrats yeah. on that! Yeah. Why don't you uh, why don't you explain a little bit about what that process was like for you? Because I know a lot of um of young creatives they ask me that question a lot because I self-published also. So yeah. you know they ask about um what that process was. So why don't you share that? So um the process is really easy. Like people think that it's some strenuous process, but it's like you write the book, right? You get somebody to edit it. You blink with somebody that's um, nice with drawing, painting, something like graphic design, you know, get you a slip cover, and you do the interior design, and you just submit it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it's really that easy. Okay. The hardest part, not even hard, but the most time consuming part is actually writing. Like, a lot of people, they talk about their book cover, and they talk about how they want it to look, mm -hmm. and they talk about what it's going to be about. When Was that a hard process for you? Getting all, getting all those pieces together? Yeah, somewhat, but I mean, the girl, my kid that I work with, she's extremely talented, but she got a lot of good ideas, and, you know, I'm, you know, I can't draw, I can't paint, I'm not good at any of that stuff, but she's good at taking my ideas and, like, turning it into something physical, and that's why I always, you know, go to her, like, if I need logos, if I need flies, if I need a book cover, because she's good, and I'm not the best at articulating myself all the time. You know what I'm saying? So I be mumbling and jumbling and saying like and just trying to explain to her these vague ideas. Like I just want to look like this, and she always bring it to life. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So what's so what's been the balance, especially since you become an author? You know what I mean? The balance. How have you been balancing um, your actual performance art mm -hmm. with you know the content, the, the literal content that you've been putting out? You know, are they one and the same for you, or is it? a different aspect of creativity when you're, you're sitting down and you're writing something that you want to publish and um, you're creating something and when you're creating something that you want to move a crowd because I've seen you do both yeah I feel like it's, it's different because when I'm uh, writing essays um, it's like I write you know knowing that it's going to get read mm -hmm. so it's like punctuation and grammar and certain words, you know what I'm saying? Like if I use the same word over and over, I'm like, that's not going to look good on the page. Mm -hmm. As opposed to being on stage, it's more, you know, 
harder. It's a little yeah, bit like, freer. Yeah, it's freer. Like, like, you can do what you want for real. You know what I'm saying? I feel like it's more, you know. I talked to a poet recently that kind of that, that told me something I thought like was dope. He was like, you know, the difference between, he said to him the difference between um, written word and spoken word is, you know, when he's the one speaking it, he can bend the words as he chooses. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like when you're writing, you don't know the cadence that somebody's going to be reading from. You know, you don't know the, the, the speed and all that kind of stuff yeah. that they're going to be. So it's like he writes in a little bit more of a rudimentary yeah. fashion when he knows somebody's going to be reading it than when he's actually spitting it. And that's how I feel like that's how you know if a person is like a genius writer when they can bring out those same emotions on a page and, you know, stand up in front of people speaking. Because you can read some people's work and it'll really make you bust out laughing mm -hmm. or it'll make you cry. You know what I'm saying? People that can do that on stage is one thing because you can say it how you want to say it. Mm -hmm. But to be able to write it in a way that'll really make people laugh and cry when you ain't saying nothing, they just read it. I feel like that's his own um, yeah. thing a lot of people can't do. There's only a few people that I see that like, you know what I'm saying? And you one of the few people that I've seen that's actually been able to, to, to captivate the crowd like that. I remember probably the last time I seen you perform in person was um was at the the, the end of school year celebration at Royal Farms Arena. I seen oh, yeah, you yeah, move yeah, yeah. a whole arena full of people, you know. Um What's what's that feeling like for you? You know, is that is that still kind of new? Yeah. You know, or have, have you gotten comfortable with it yet? No, I'm I'm still not comfortable with it. It's just weird. And like you got like hundreds of people just staring at you, just like waiting, <laughs> waiting to see what you're gonna say. Yeah. If you could, make me feel bad, something. You know what I'm saying? To make you feel something. And then with high school kids, it's always like a hit or miss. Like mm -hmm. they can be easily captivated and like you know give you their full attention, or they can be like throwing stuff at each other across the line like they phone, you know what I'm saying? Right. But um, it's like I'm always real anxious before I go up and like kind of like midway through it kind of like ease down but then when I get off stage like it builds right back up people just want to talk to you mm -hmm. and you know I don't know that shit is be weird for real. Understood, understood. So one of the things that you did definitely just touch on is you know the emotion. And um, in your in your first two books, really, that's one thing that's kind of consistent all the way through. You know, um, everybody that I put your books in the hands of has come back telling me about the emotional roller coaster that they kind of went on through you. You know, you talk about a lot from you know witnessing uh, your brother your brother pass away to you know the, the the different things that you had to go through just navigating your way through the, the through growing up in the east side of Baltimore. So like was art was that an outlet for you initially or was that just something that you felt as though the story needed to get told so you were going to tell it? Because it seems like you're kind of working through a lot in your own work even as I read it. Alright, so I want you to think about the answer to that question and we'll hit it when we come back from the break. All right. When we come back from break, we'll continue our conversation with Kondwani Fidel. My name is Clint. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Victoria. I'm Justin H. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Danielle, and I'm an alcoholic. My name's Mark. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Dorothy T., and I am an alcoholic. For so long, alcohol has sort of been there for me to sort of see me through social situations. I didn't really know how to communicate. I had no friends. I burned every single bridge. My family had cut ties for me. I was unemployable and all of those things because, you know, drinking was more important than anything else. I had my last drink when I was sitting at a bus stop in Savannah, Georgia. My journey in AA started years ago when I reached the outside limits of my desperation. I really wanted to quit drinking. I just couldn't stop on my own. And you know, I remember when I woke up on the day that I got sober, I felt something inside of me tell me that I could go to AA. And then these people, you know, just gathered around me. And it was just an amazing experience because that was the fellowship in action in my life. They took me to Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous has saved my life. The moral of my story today. And we're back, continuing our conversation with Kondwani Fidel. 
So, before we left, we were talking a lot about um, the emotion that you put into your work. Um, I was kind of asking because, you know, obviously because of the reception that I've got, I've gotten from other people and just from what I interpreted myself, it seems as though like a lot of your work seems to be therapeutic for you. Like almost like you're working your way through some type of emotions and things that you're experiencing. Is that a, is that a part of your art? Um, I feel like the therapy comes when people tell me how much my work influences them. So I had people said they read my work, they heard my work, and it made them want to become writers or better writers or even looking at my, you know, the few accomplishments that I had and make them just want to be like better versions of themselves. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I feel like that's what started people for me. But when I first started writing um, about my story and, you know, things that I went through, I just did it because the people that I looked up to was doing it as far as like the Jay-Z's, the J. Cole's, and, you know, the Nicky Giovanni's, the people that I was reading at that time. And I was like, oh, they tell me this story, I'm going to tell mine too. And then the responses that I was getting from people is what made me like, okay, this is what I need to be on because it's helping. You feel me? Understood. So, let's take it back then. Mm -hmm. Before the poetry, before, you know, the spoken word. Yeah. Um, as a young kid growing up east side of Baltimore City, um, tell me about life. What was that like? I mean, yo, we just used to be chilling. Like, I mean, we used to be chilling around the way, you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. down the hill way. It would be on Miami Street, it would be on Jefferson Street, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like, we would go to Tex, play basketball, shoot dice, might drink a little bit, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? You big on were you big on like sports and stuff or I mean, I were played, you like I what played, were your what were your outlets? I on? mean I played I played basketball but I ain't really get in like that. I always yeah. played good defense though. Like like <laughs> strap yeah, like, 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 like if I could for real, I, mean, I, was, I was I was yo, I was nice on the D tip for real. Like uh -huh. I mean so they put me in but I only really got in the game like if it was like up by twenty five or down by twenty five, so I mean, like, I don't that. Yo, respect, yo. Both people don't, don't admit that. I don't want for me, for real. You know what I'm yeah, saying? But, like, yeah. my homeboy D, like, Rain Man, Renard, P, like, I was hanging around with dude, uh, dude John John. You know what I'm saying? Like, I came up with, like, the kid was playing. We used to play yeah. now, uh, down on Lake Cliff, then, like, the little Easter tournaments and all that. But mm -hmm. I, I never really was, like, you know, the best. But I, I love basketball. Yeah. So, what were, you, what were you probably most interested in before you think you found your way? Like, before you realize that yo, this this art and this writing and this writing is what I want to do, where did you see yourself? Um, I just always knew that. I, don't know, I just knew that I just wanted a lot of money. That mm -hmm. was it for real. Like I was just fascinated by like money and like nice cars and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. everybody around you know, they had it and they was getting all the attention and the love. And I just wanted to be that for real. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Even um, you know, I wanted to be uh, a sport agent. You mm -hmm. know. Uh, going into college, but it was only because, um, you know, it was this guy that was going to city, you know, the high school I was at, his father was a sport agent, so he used to come through with all the slip cars, and everybody mm -hmm. knew his father, and everybody knew him, and I was just more fascinated with the lifestyle the world. I didn't really have no true aspirations or goals, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? I just was like anybody else, just wanted money, just wanted love, and, you know, to take care of your family, that's pretty much it, man. I didn't know how I was going to get it done. So how about now? Do you still do you still have that same mindset or are you are you are you more goal goal oriented? Yeah, at this I'm, point def I'm definitely more goal oriented, you know, as far as like um, you know, having projects that I'm working on as far as like books or mm -hmm. just like trying to write like some, you know, some short film stuff. You see yourself moving into film next? Yeah. Is that is that yeah. what you're interested in? Yeah, just like being around it more is, you know, I'm more intrigued by it. and then mm -hmm. I just wanna just try different stuff to see what I'm good at. You know what I'm saying? Like I started out writing poetry, and then um, you know what I'm saying? I linked up with D, and um, you know I was reading his work, and I was like, I want to write essays too. You know what I'm saying? I was like, I want to challenge myself. Right? Yeah, right. yeah, he watched it. So I was like, um, you know, I want to challenge myself for real and try writing essays. And you know, I believe that I'm, I still got so much room to get better, but I became, you know, good at it, and I feel like I can do the same with other. So speaking of speaking of um, other writers in Baltimore, like you know D. Watkins, who you just mentioned, who are the people that kind of inspired you um, from an artistic standpoint? Uh, I remember you, you mentioned Nicky Giovanni, um, yeah. and who was up? 
uh, Maya Angelou. Yeah. But who are some other ones? Was that were, were really just like the old the old guard of artists that we all kind of heard about growing yeah, up? Yeah, and a lot of rappers. Like I'm heavily influenced by hip hop, so I was reading like Jay Z's book, The Code It. Mm -hmm. uh, I was reading his rap lyrics, Nas, J Cole, my favorite. I was reading Fabo's rap lyrics, like. Um, Tupac, one of my favorite people, Amy Winehouse, you know what I'm saying? I was like listening to their stuff, but I was reading it too. And that was helping me become a better writer and a better, a better storyteller. You got an album dropping soon? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've been seeing that at the performances, you've been doing some yeah. some mixtures between the two of, of you know, the, the poetry mixed with the song. I, yeah. I feel like that might be a dope album yeah, at some it point. Might, it might be, you know, I just don't want to. On some Gil Scott Heron yeah, stuff, you I, know? Yeah, I was just listening to his joint the other day. But yeah, I don't, um, I just don't want it to be forced for real. Mm -hmm. I just want it to come. If it happened, it happened. You know, I feel like it is, though. I got you. So, like, let's talk about this new project. Um, it just dropped, correct? Or right. it drops? It drops August 12th. Okay, at, cool. At, at the book so this is a, this is an extended copy right yeah, here. Yeah, it's a proof copy. Yeah, okay, yeah. bet, bet, bet. Well, tell 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 us a little bit about it. Like, how did it how did it come to fruition? Like, what idea sparked it? Mm -hmm. All right, so I was in New York um, with D. Watkins, and we was eating dinner with um, Tracy. I forgot her last name, but she's a big time editor. And um, they was talking about this book called Medical Apartheid. And yeah, they yeah, was like, yo, that book, yeah, Wicked. Crazy. You got you got to read it. You got to read it. Like I said. One of my best characters, traces that I listen, especially when my mentor telling me something I always listen. So I went and caught the book and I started reading it. And um, I came up on a part when it was talking about uh, the Kennedy Creek Institute, you know, they affiliated with John Hopkins, about how them and the landlords um, had this lead paint abatement study test. Mm -hmm. And that's how um, all these people in Baltimore City got affected with lead paint poisoning. Mm -hmm. So I knew that a lot of people in Baltimore had lead. But I never knew that it was a study that happened that made these people get laid. I thought that they probably moved in like, you know, ramshackle homes and like it was just like a luck of the draw type thing, you know, it was a whole study. So you had these landlords, they was basically trying to use a cheap technique, but at the expense of black bodies. You can mm -hmm. essentially be like, okay, how long can we keep people in these homes until they basically go mentally retarded and blind? Mm -hmm. So they was growing these black families and these poor black families with like food stamps, toys of necessities that like a poor family might need. Right. You know what I'm saying? I lower them in there. And uh, the KKI Institute, you know, workers, they would go to the homes and monitor the uh, layer levels in there, but they never was telling the parents that when they uh, agree to be a part of this program, that's going to put their children at mm -hmm. high, high, you know, level. Higher risk. risk. Yeah, yeah, high risk to get lit. So um, this was going on for the whole uh, early 90s, for real. And in 2001, um, it got taken to court. And the judge was like, yo, this is unconstitutional what y'all doing. It's similar to the, the, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. And y'all treated these black kids in Baltimore like canaries in a mine. Mm -hmm. So I heard the phrase canaries in a mine. I read it. And I was like, hey, what do that mean? Mm -hmm. And a quick Google search fixed that. So I hopped on there and found that canaries in a mine um, came from the 20th century when miners used to go into their tunnels. They would take canaries with them. And if Dangerous gases yeah, yeah. such as like carbon monoxide smoke and mm -hmm. canaries would die. Mm -hmm. So that gave them a clear cup warning to either get out of there or put on protective respirator gear so they won't die. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you know, that's that's messed up. And um I came out up with hummingbirds in the trenches off of that idea. Because like canaries not supposed to be in the mines. Like mm -hmm. God didn't create them to live a life of oppression, just like how he didn't create us hummingbirds you know, to live in a trench. Like, you'll never see a hummingbird, you know, zipping out on the street. That's because they don't belong there. That's so, what I love, yeah. yeah I, so love, I love that analogy because yeah. it's like, it's a lot like, um, like, I used to hate, I still hate to this day when people talk about that whole crabs in the barrel mentality yeah. and they talk about our city. It's like, yeah. the barrel is in a crab's natural habitat. Yeah. So, like, you know, like, I, I love that, I love that concept and that idea. That's, that's something that I wish more people would, like, shine light on because, yeah. Oftentimes, when people talk about our city, you'll hear people talk about the crime rate. You'll hear people talk about the addiction rate. You'll hear people talk about um, the issues with school dropouts and all that, but they won't talk about the issues that create the crime, the issues that um, that force our kids to want to drop out of school. You know, all of those things. So, like, I do you think? How do you think artists' roles, a artist's role, fits into that narrative? 
Because I, I see you, I yeah. see you do that a lot. So I feel like um, it's it's hard, man, because like I, I was talking to D. Watkins a few times, and I'll I'll ask him, he'll probably answer some change, but I'll ask him like, yo, why doesn't this person do more for the people? Or why doesn't this person do that? And he was basically telling me like, yo, that he's his own man, mm -hmm. she, you know, her own woman. Mm -hmm. They really don't owe us anything. They could do what they want. So it's like I'd be stuck between that, giving everybody they own their body, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Because they can do whatever they want with it. But then it's like, I also get caught up and I get upset sometimes, but I try to catch myself like, yo, you could be doing so much more for the community. You could be using your voice in a better way. You get what I'm saying? But it's like I'm always torn. It's easy that. to get frustrated like that when you yeah. see examples of other people. Mm -hmm. I just try personally to, to say, all right, mm -hmm. this is how I want if I want to see somebody like speaking up on this issue, then I don't be wanting to say something, yeah. you know, rather than judging somebody else for yeah. not doing it. Yeah. So it's like, and people always talk about the people who not doing quote unquote real work, but I'm like, yo, for as long as protests and activism been a thing in this country, it's always been people who've been frauds and people who've been, you get what I'm saying? That, that and who's in a position to judge what's real and what's fake? That's the question I always want. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's people who like exploit and take money you know what I'm saying? And just want to be the face and just want to do it for the money, the fame, the chick. So it, it is those people. But my thing is, why are we focusing on those people? Focus on people who are going real. Put your energy into that. Keep calling out people on Twitter. Keep saying, oh, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. Trying to, I don't you know, see how that helps us. You know what I'm saying? Trying to crucify people, you know, on a platform. It's like, for what? Why even get that man attention? Like, don't focus on him. Focus on the people who really don't work. We can probably name like 10 people in this community that's doing work yeah. in Baltimore. You get what I'm saying? So why focus on the people who not are doing faith work? Yeah, that's what I say all the time. It's like, yo, I would rather give my attention to the people that are actually doing the work. You know what I'm saying? Like, and also, like, I just don't like this idea that like we're in this culture now where everybody feels as though they can judge. Like, I can tell you, like, I don't like the way that you got this program with these kids. All right, then you make a program. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I feel as though as long as people are doing good work, you know what I'm saying, like, let them do the work like, and you focus on what you got going on. You need to do yeah. this, you should be doing this. Yo, you do that, that's what I'm doing. You exactly. know what I'm saying? Like, exactly. that's what I'm on right now. So if you want to, you know what I'm saying, do something for another group of people or for people in South Baltimore, then do that. Don't tell me what I should do with my time. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. So um, when we come back, I definitely want to dive into this whole time period that we're living in right now, both politically and socially. Um, I want to ask some questions about how you think the arts kind of fits into all of that and, you know, kind of what some of the things that you're working on um, in that length. So when we come back, we'll continue the co our conversation with Kondwani Fidel. Catch you in a minute. I'm 5'11". Barely 5'4". I weigh about 170 pounds. Brown eyes. Blue eyes. Brown hair. Gray hair. I'm a baseball fanatic. I'm a wife. A mom. A sister. And a grandfather. I'm a bodybuilder. I'm a research analyst. Small business owner. Teacher. Dance fitness instructor. Film and television actor. I'm an office clerk. I'm a copywriter. I'm a veteran. I have a prosthetic leg. I have multiple sclerosis. I have lupus. Cerebral palsy. Post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm blind. And I'm working in a job I love. I love. Because I was given a chance. Because I was given a chance. To contribute my skills and talents. To show my disability is only one part of who I am. Who I am. Who I am. At work, it's what people can do that matters. For more information, visit whatcanyoudocampaign.org. population now over 7 billion people. It's important that we stay connected to our global neighbors more than ever. For over two decades, ICES has brought cultural awareness to thousands of exchange students from all over the world. Thanks to my host family, I had the chance to travel, enjoy American sports, and volunteer in their community. This has been one of the best things I've ever done. My family's hosted foreign exchange students for the past 12 years, and every year it's like adding a new member to our family. Such citizen diplomacy may start with one visiting student and his or her host family, but it ripples throughout communities in the United States and abroad. 
Many exchange students return home with positive impressions of America, and they go on to become leaders in their own countries. I'm able to share my culture with my host family, and from that experience, I've made lifelong friends. There's no better way to learn firsthand about a foreign country and its culture than from the perspective of an exchange student who has grown up there. Each year, thousands of American families think globally and act locally by hosting a high school exchange student for an academic year or a semester. ICES, bringing the world closer, one smile at a time. Welcome back to Art Talk with Aaron Maven. Again, we're sitting with Kangwani Fidel, just chopping it up on um, everything art, culture, politics, you know. So let's dive into um, locally, kind of uh, this thing that's happening right now. Um, for one, what's it like, you know, from your perspective, just being an artist, you know, living and working in Baltimore, 2018, you know, uh, it's a really kind of, it's a really crazy time right now, but artistically, I've never really seen during my li my lifetime, at least, um, our creative community be where it's at. So why don't you uh, get your perspective on that? See, when I was at Virginia State, um, the only artists that I saw were people who, you know, fit that artist mold. When I'm talking about like in the physical, like the way they dress, like crazy hair, like that yeah, idea, yeah. like for the artists. But so that's what I saw as artists. So I never even really saw myself as an artist. Before. And then when I, 2015, when I came back to Baltimore, I didn't know about our artist community, I didn't know about the spoken word community, I didn't know about none of that stuff, like all of this stuff was new to me. Mm -hmm. So, I just kind of, you know, just was outperforming and then like the universe just pulled people into my life who was similar to me, mm -hmm. you get what I'm saying? And I don't really see myself as part as like the art community, you get what I'm saying? Why like, not? I wonder, I wonder why. Because I don't know the art. The art community is like one of those terms that's just so watered down, and, and everybody, everybody just use it. You get what I'm saying? Like it's just like being an activist. Like everybody an activist. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? Like everybody is something. You get what I'm saying? And sometimes I just don't be wanting to be a part of that. And like just, you know, from my experience with people in the artist community, I don't know. It just be it just be weird. Like in a sense, like. It's, it'd be like a soap opera sometimes, you get what I'm saying? Like, it's like, it's like, it's like, you know, more talk, less art, you get what I'm saying? Like, they look like artists, but they don't really be doing nothing. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? Like, we really got track records right, that we can show the stuff that we do in schools, and we can show how, you get what I'm saying, how art influenced the world. But it's like these people just run around just looking like artists. You but I feel like, I feel like this, the squad of people that I typically see you around is yeah. definitely people that are moving and shaking and, and doing great work, you know what I mean, definitely. in the community. I would definitely. I would I would definitely uh, I could definitely acknowledge that that's true, that there are a lot of people yeah. out here that's that's talking a lot more than they're actually um, doing. But I definitely think that, you know, we got some uh, we got some amazing creators yeah, in this city that, definitely. you know, we're doing some dope stuff right now. You know, obviously you you counted among them. Um, but I was talking more so in the sense of like, I don't know, maybe maybe I, I see things. So basically what I'm saying is like, my art scene isn't the, you know, hegemonic idea of the art scene in Baltimore. You just like how, just like how I do want to talk about it's two Baltimore. Mm -hmm. It's two Baltimore art scenes. Mm -hmm. That's how I look at it. You got bourgeoisie like, and then yeah, people be like, like, oh, you know so and so in the art scene? I'm like, no. You know so and so in the art scene? I'm like, no. They're like, oh, you know, you know, you know, Iron Maiden? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know Devin Allen? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know so and so? I'm like, oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? They're the homies. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? They do good work. And that's my scene. Understood. You feel me? But I don't really know what's going on, you know, in, you know, like. Yeah, yeah. The, the, you know, yeah. So, another thing that, um, I definitely recognize in your work that um, I think is really powerful is really the vulnerability. I think I feel like that would be the right word to describe it. You know, you talk uh, you talk a lot about um, about depression. You know, about uh, uh, suicidal thoughts, about you know mental illness, all of these different things that like I really don't typically see a lot of people that look like us discussing. You know what I mean? Um, 
in projects like the one you put out, you know, where a lot of the readership is people from the trenches that we grow up in. So, um, can you talk a little bit about that? Was that easy for you? Is that something that um, that you found hard to do at first, being so transparent, especially when we're living in a society that tends to be a lot more judgmental to men that, that, that are that open with their emotions? It was hard because I just ain't want people to think that I was crazy. <laughs> like, I thought, like, if we talk about suicide, I was yeah. like, oh, he's crazy, you know what I'm saying? Like, so that's, like, the main thing that I was scared of. Like, I, ain't want, I ain't want people to, like, like stray away from me because, like, oh, he, you know, wants some weird stuff. But Was it weird how many people actually, like, embraced it? Yeah. Instead, that's, like, that's where not, the judgment wasn't yeah, necessarily not, there, but they like, yo, I, I was thinking the same. Yeah, thing. that's not what I was expecting. But what made me go ahead and just start writing about it, I was like, yo, what you scared for? Like, what haven't you saw already? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You're from Baltimore. Like, you scared to write some words now? You scared to tell the world how you feel? Mm -hmm. When you just saw this and been through that? So that's the, you know, the pressure that I put on myself to make me, you know, go ahead and write about that. You know, just being vulnerable. Like I say, I'm not no mental health expert. But I know that if I talk about it, you know what I'm saying, that'll, you know, hopefully motivate other people to talk about the issue and then they probably can get like the special help that they that they need. I think that's really important, bro. Like like obviously you know that mental mental health and emotional wellness to me is like a big thing yeah. in our community, you know. Um people of people of color are twenty percent more likely to deal with, you know, depression. Suicidal thoughts, you know what I mean. Um, all of these different issues that that plague us um, in our communities, and it's something I don't really feel like we talk about. Like I actually, and the crazy thing is, I can remember when me and you and I think D and Tarek maybe we were all. I think we were at my crib for something that we had going on, and we were talking about that. And I think that you were the one that kind of brought it. He was like, "Yo, you ever think any of y'all ever think we just..." We out here, like, we all of us got, like, you know, I don't remember exactly what you said. It wasn't crazy, but did any of y'all ever think that, like, yeah, we, we just struggling with trauma, and we kind of laughed it off, but that was a real question. I don't care what nobody say. If you grew up in the city, like, grew up in the streets, not even necessarily in the streets, like, you grew up in Baltimore, like, either it was public housing or it was, you know, Section 8 or whatever the case would be. Like, if you grew up in the hood, I feel like everybody has some type of mental trauma that they deal with, even if they don't know, it, even if it's undiagnosed. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? Because you got people, you know, you mean people, they be like, yo, my brother died 30 years ago, and I'm just like, you know, I've never been the same since, like a mm -hmm. straight, complete wreck, like messed their whole life up. And I'm like, yo, your brother died 30 years ago. Like, I know some people that's 35, and they've been losing people for 30 years. You get what I'm saying? Like, every year. Mm -hmm. You feel me? So it's like, this guy over here, you know what I'm saying, and went through this one traumatic experience, but we see it every day. Mm -hmm. Even if we don't see it, we hear it, we smell it, we taste it, you know what I'm saying? Like even you got, even if something don't happen to one of your homeboys, it happened to one of your homeboys' homeboys, mm -hmm. or somebody in your family friend. You know what I'm saying? I lost two in the past two weeks. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's legit every mm -hmm. day, so people, and I realize how different Baltimore is and like the, the psyche of the people is when I travel to other places, you know what I'm saying? And I see like they don't have the same mentality as us, so. I feel like it's just it's just levels of like the trauma. You get what I'm saying? One of my favorite pieces that I read, I think it was in Raw Wounds. I'm pretty sure it was in Raw Wounds. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was a it was a it was a, a piece where you were talking about you and a, a few of your homeboys. Y'all were all kind of sitting around. Yeah. And your friend told you about how mm -hmm. um, a relative of theirs had just died, and yeah. they were just heartbroken over it. Yeah. And y'all had that whole that whole, you know, yeah. toughen up, you be all right. Yeah. Like, you know I feel like that's so natural yeah. for people that grow up in the environments that we grow up in, that like, I just was extremely proud when I saw you just tackle it head on the way that you did, because I know that personally, a lot of people that um, have told me that they were struggling with, you know, one thing or another, you know, they felt so uncomfortable sharing it with others yeah. that, in some ways, I felt as though they got in the way of their own healing process. Yeah. You feel me? And I think that we definitely need to have a lot more artists, entertainers, whatever, just being more open about it because it's like there's definitely a stigma yeah. around it. I believe you. Yeah. You you agree with that? Yeah. And I feel like it's as we're able to kind of get real about the things that we're going through and struggling with and how we're dealing with it. Yeah. You know, I admit 
I go to therapy every two weeks, you know what I mean? Like, I don't feel like it's the be-all, end-all, but it definitely helps me, you know, kind of make sense of the things that I'm dealing with. And hopefully, like, me sharing that, somebody else will hear it and say, like, yo, maybe I should at least try it. You know what I mean? Like, so I definitely wanted to commend you on that. But what, what are, um, besides the fact, the, the mental health issue, what are some of the things that you want to, that you want to highlight through your work that, you know what I mean, you see as though uh, uh, we can make changes in a society? So one thing that I try to highlight in my work, um, you know, because I don't, I don't write to show, you know, I don't write to try to persuade the system not to be racist mm -hmm. or racist people not to be racist. I basically write so I can get people that look like me, that come from communities like mine, to see what's really going on. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? So they can know how to operate and they can know how to maneuver. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? So I try to highlight that in my work and I try to get them to understand that it's not your fault. You get what I'm saying? When y'all go to jail, it's not your fault. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? Like I even say in one of my essays, I say, yo, the kids who pop pistol shed tears too. Like it's not your fault, bro. Everything that's going on is supposed to be going on. So I try to get them to understand that. You know, sometimes even if it's a little thing like, you know, people try to do what you tell them they can't do. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I try to get them to understand, like, oh, the system don't want to see y'all here, don't want to see you there. So that's why you gotta, you know, get on your stuff. That's why you gotta get your mother out of hood. That's why you gotta read so you can become a critical thinker. That's why you gotta do these things. So I try to get them to understand the world that we live in. And, like, I learn all of these things and I read these, you know, history books and I do research and I just try to bring that down to a level so they can see it. You get what I'm saying? I feel like that's, that's one thing I try to highlight in my work, like in a nutshell, is that like it's not our fault, it's not our fault, it's never the oppressed ever. Mm -hmm. And what's been, what's been like the most difficult part of this journey for you? Um, and that can be personal life, professional, like what's been the biggest obstacle that you feel like you've had to climb? I would say I'm, I still don't like treasure, like treasure every moment for real, like like a certain accomplishments, mm -hmm. like I should be like happy and excited about it. And it's like, I be fake happy, you know what I'm saying? I be like, oh, that's nice. But then it's like, it just go back, you know, to regular, like, even like when I went to London, you know, I was excited that I got invited for like a split second, but then it like just, it was like, oh, you should be excited, you should live in the moment. But it's like, I'm just always thinking about what's going on back home. I'm always thinking about, I'm, a, I'm always in my own head and just like, you know, just worried about the state of people. You know what I'm saying? Black people. Was that was that your first time out of the country? No. Oh, okay. What was that experience like though? Mm. Was that your first time in England? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, what was it like? How would you like it? It was chill. I mean, I was I was you know geeked out the fact that um, there's people in another country that like that like my work for real. Mm -hmm. So that's just like mm -hmm. okay, okay, you know, like a little you know. And um, a couple people that follow me on social media came out to my event, so that was like the cool part. But I mean, London is a nice city. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a New York. You get what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Like, especially the part that I was in. I was in Stratford, London, so it's like, um, you know, like kind of like a touristy place. So mm -hmm. it, it don't, I didn't really get the feel of vibes while I was there. You know, like real, you know, a uh, real Londoners. Mm -hmm. You feel me? Because I'm around where everybody come here to travel from all over the world. It's just like New York, like mm -hmm. Manhattan. You don't really get no New York culture. You know what I'm saying? So like you go into like the boroughs and stuff like that. So that's kind of how the experience was. Like it was just, it was just. I felt like I was pretty much, you know, like waking up in the morning. Okay, I'm in London, but it really ain't feel like me being nowhere else. Like say if I go to like John or something, you know what I'm saying? Like you gonna just feel different. Yeah, yeah. Different. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. London looks like a lot of major cities in America for real. Mm -hmm. So um, we talked about. The fact that that wasn't your only, where else is your art taking you? For those, for those that aren't familiar, because I, I definitely have seen you everywhere in the States. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. um, what's, what's been, what's been some of the places that, that your art is taking you? Probably the wildest place in South Dakota. And South Dakota. <laughs> and it's crazy because, Kanye country. <laughs> it was crazy because when I was, um, when I used to meet girls at Virginia State, I used to lie, just bluffing like, yeah, they used to be like, oh, where you from? I'd be like, I'm from South Dakota, just lying. Like, I, don't even know, like I, don't, I didn't know where South Dakota was on the right, map at the time. Right. They'd be like, oh my God, are you all right from there? Why are you coming in? And I was like, I didn't make up stuff. Then I told them I was joking. Mm -hmm. But to um, get an email that said that like, they wanted me out there to like, teach some workshops, it was funny. So like, South Dakota, Chicago. How many black people you see out there? 
Yo, it's a lot of Native Americans out there. I ain't really seen no black people like that. It's a few. Uh -huh. But it's, you know, they got the reservations out there too. So like, they got like mile long reservations. Of, like, so was it a Native American organization that brought you out? Um, I don't really know her ethnicity. Oh, okay. But when, when I was there, um, I linked up with a lot of Native Americans that were like doing work in their communities and like, trying to build up their communities. Mm -hmm. I really forgot the name of it. And um, I think it's in my notes on it, but like they they in the process of building this entire community and like they gonna have a free housing and stuff for um, the people who like live in the trailers and in the mm -hmm. reservations like and the, and the homes are like real live like new state of the art type builds you know what I'm saying yeah, so yeah. it's a lot of people out there doing, doing good stuff there. when we come back we're gonna finish up our conversation with Kandwani Fidel catch us when oh, no. When we come back from break, we're going to finish up our conversation with Kangwani Fidel. Stick around. Hi, I'm Chris Burke, an actor who happens to have Down syndrome. Join me in watching some great stories about inspiring people with Down syndrome. Somebody asks me what Down syndrome is, I tell them it's just an extra chromosome in your body and it just makes learning a little more difficult. I just hope many people with Down syndrome can follow their dreams and the passion of what they love to do. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. I think she has more abilities than I do. Just to emit this incredible love that everybody was drawn to. I thought his story was amazing. I thought it needed to get out there to inspire other people. My name is Annie. I'm a fan of Bardo. I'm my this is my great story. You can watch at ndss.org slash stories. My son is a handsome young man, like a movie star. There's no limit to what he can do. I don't know why he would ruin himself with alcohol. When I think about the happy boy he used to be and how sad his life is now, breaks my heart. I love him as much as I ever did, maybe more, but I don't understand why this is happening. My therapist recommended I go to Al-Anon family groups. He said Al-Anon members have lived through the same kinds of things that are happening to my family. I didn't want to go to Al-Anon, and I didn't want anyone to know how difficult it's been, but I'm glad I went. Is someone's drinking breaking your heart? You might be surprised at what you can learn in an Al-Anon family group from people just like you. Call 1-888-4-AL-ANON or go to alanon.org. My name is Clint. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Victoria. I'm Justin H. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Danielle, and I'm an alcoholic. My name's Mark. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Dorothy T., and I am an alcoholic. For so long, alcohol has sort of been there for me to sort of see me through social situations. I didn't really know how to communicate. I had no friends. I burned every single bridge. My family had cut ties for me. I was unemployable and all of those things because, you know, drinking was more important than anything else. I had my last drink when I was sitting at a bus stop in Savannah, Georgia. My journey in AA started years ago when I reached the outside limits of my desperation. I really wanted to quit drinking. I just couldn't stop on my own. And you know, I remember when I woke up on the day that I got sober. I felt something inside of me tell me that I could go to AA. And then these people, you know, just gathered around me, and it was just an amazing experience because that was the fellowship in action in my life. They took me to Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous has saved my life. The moral of my story today. Welcome back, everyone. Once again, I'm Aaron Maven, and this is Art Talk with Kondrati Fidel. So, to finish this thing off, man, let's actually get into uh, this read campaign that you've started, man. Why don't you tell the people a little bit about it? I think that that's a, a powerful, powerful campaign. So, um, you know, myself, if I'm walking the street and, you know, I need to say I need to do 
some chores or something, right? Mm -hmm. And I know that if I see a, a Mr. Clean billboard or something, you know what I'm saying? I'm gonna be like, oh man, I gotta go do that. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I need to, you know. So in my mind, I was like, okay, if I start this read campaign and I got everybody, you know, in the world running around with the word read on that shirt and people will see that. You know, people always say, oh, I need to read more, I need to read more, but they never really read more. So I feel like it's just like a, you know, just a, um, you know, just a, something that people can see, and you know, it's like a daily reminder or a reminder whenever you say, like, "Okay, I need to read more." Hopefully, that influences people to read for real. You know How did the idea come come about? Was it when you were teaching, or was it just something that you kind of something that I just came up with? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't like nothing like real deep. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Because I know what I do with in schools, and that's one way that influence people to read. And I was just thinking of another way that. I can influence people to read, and also I can, um, you know, like get into the entrepreneurial world as well, as far as like, you know, selling. How's that been going so far? It's been cool, you know. It's it's, it's always, uh, you know, you have your ups and your downs because you like a small business, if that's what you want to call it. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? And like, you know, it's what do you um? What do you think has been the biggest lesson that you've learned as an entrepreneur? You know, over the past few years, not only are you you know doing um, doing your spoken word, your clothing, the books, and all that kind of stuff, but like you're really the the master of your own brand. So you know, uh, for the young entrepreneurs that are watching, what advice would you kind of get based on what you learned? You got to hustle. You got to hustle. People get blinded by social media followings and. You know, the followers and they think, oh, if I just post this, I'm going to get like 100 people going to buy my stuff. Like, all that stuff is like, <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, if I wish I wish them thousands of followers did, like, you right, know, right, right. You know, trans translate them to dollars. Like, I wish. You know what I'm saying? But you really got to hustle. Like, um, the dude Flo I always say, he say, uh, DJ Flo, mm -hmm. he say, uh, Shout out Flo. He say, uh, you know, the internet is cluttered, but like, the streets are wide open. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And I, and I utilize that knowledge all the time. Like, get out there and talk to real people. You know what I'm saying? Sell your stuff and also do your thing on social media, you know, on the internet as well. But you need to be out here, you need to be hustling. And I would say that it's like, you know, the, the best thing that I learned, like I said, I'm a good listener. So I listen to people's advice, I listen to other people's ideas, the people smarter than me. You know, I shut up, I let them talk, and um, I utilize what they teach me, and, you know, put it, you know, use it, use it for myself and my business. So, and another thing that I definitely want to commend you on, but also kind of pick your brain about a little bit, is um, everything that I see you do pretty much. You know, and that's something that I really respect about you, D, and other folks that um, are in the city. Everything, every event of yours that I've seen, every uh, project that I've seen you put out, is not just you on the project. You know what I mean? It's a couple young kids even that I've actually started following because I first saw them perform either with you or at one of the, your events. So talk about, you know, this that idea of paying it forward and how and how that fits into your um, your overall event. Yeah, I mean just like lift as you climb for real. That's a, a, a phrase that I learned when I was in college and I just use it in real life like people say it. But I, I use it in real life, you know what I'm saying? Like deep throw me some alley oops, you know what I'm saying? I throw Scott Thompson some alley oops and Scott probably throw the other do some alley oops. That's how you do it for real. You know what I'm saying? And people think that if you help somebody else it's going to take away from what you're doing or it's going to you know, lessen your chance of getting to the top. But that's not true. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? So that's all I want to do because I know that, you know, like they always talk about things like instant cash. You know, how can you help people out now? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? If I like writing the whole plan, I'm like, okay, I know I'm going to be in front of 500 people. You know, they probably don't know who Scott is. You know what I'm saying? This might be a, a major stepping stone for you if you get in front of these 500 people. You know what I'm saying? You might get booked for the rest of your life out of this Like, who knows? Mm -hmm. So I always had that mentality. That's dope. That's dope. And I definitely wanted to, to also touch on um, the community aspect, you know, because I see you always around, whether it's, you know, just attending events or, you know, give, or supporting other people. What what are you working on kind of in the community? Are there any, any initiatives that, you, um, that, you're, that you're helping with or, or looking to start yourself? Yeah, so I'm, I'm working on starting this program, um, and it's basically going to be an initiative to get Baltimore writers and artists and um, thinkers uh, required like, in the 
public schools or whatever. Mm, so right. I feel like, me personally, I just feel like every single school in Baltimore City should have a required read and buy a Baltimore author. If it's a children's book, if it's a novel, if it's nonfiction, if it's whatever, you get what I'm saying? Every school in Baltimore City should have someone teaching children some type of craft. And talk about why that's should important. Be, it should be mandatory. Like not even like a, you know how like you might get a book to come in. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't even be like off the wind like that. It should be something that's legit mandatory. And I feel like it's important because you know the what's the saying? You know you can teach somebody how to fish. You know and they'll eat a feed lifetime. Them life, feed, yeah. feed them for life. You know what I'm saying? Like I work off of that. You feel me? Like you teach somebody a skill and then they can go get their own money. They can go do their own thing. They can go influence their own nation of people, they can build their own tribe, you get what I'm saying? I also think that when you go back to earlier in our conversation when we talk about um, the accessibility the kids have to um, to a lot of the work that's being put in front of them. Um, when I was in middle school, you put Catcher in the Rye or Huckleberry Finn in front of me. I'm not really going to read this because I don't see myself in it. I don't see anything really that I know in it. I'm not... I don't feel connected to this at all, right. you know, but, you know, when you put the B-side in my hands or, you know what I mean, you put uh, 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 Black Seeds or Raw Wounds, you know, and I'm looking at street names that I recognize. I'm looking at um, cultural nuance it's that like lifestyle that you, that you see, you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. that you're a part of. Like I say all the time, like imagine paying a full with a book, like a lot of people probably will read it, you know yeah. what I'm saying? It's like, it's the same storyline as like the... The Shakespeare stuff that they be trying to get us to read and there's what, like Hamlet? Yeah, that, that was like that when, was, when somebody killed somebody. Yeah, that was some gang, that was some gang stuff right there. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. it's the same stuff. So it's like, but don't nobody want to read that. Like at the time, we think it's phony. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's good stories, but we don't appreciate those good stories because it don't relate to us. You know what I'm saying? So why keep trying to feed us this if we know we just keep pushing it away? Like try something different. Absolutely. So. In the schools, as a, as an educator, what are um, what are the, what are some of the things that you've seen? For one, that you know, are making things more difficult for our youth in getting an education, and two, things that uh, that you see coming or you see happening that you would like to continue to expound on. Um, I definitely feel like it's difficult when we try to, you know, make the students feel like they matter. But the system might like, do the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. saying that they care about the students, but they can't even get heat in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? And vice versa. Uh, you get what I'm saying? In the summer, it's just mm -hmm. like, so we tell them they mad and we, you know, try to get them to see their work, but it's like, that's one against like an entire system, just telling them no, telling them no, telling them they, ain't, they don't amount to nothing. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's like one of the biggest obstacles for real. You get what I'm saying? But like, you know, we, we had these rallies and we had these talks about gun violence and then you turn around and police kill somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And we still close to like 300 murders, you get what I'm saying? Like at the end of every year. So it's like we do all of this good work, but it's like, you know, sometimes it's like, you know, dang, like is it really, you know, helping? But one thing that I do like that I see is that it's a lot of Baltimore artists that are really Baltimore artists, not like somebody that like, you know, moved from Atlanta like five years ago and they labeled themselves a Baltimore artist, but like mm -hmm. people that really come from these streets, people that really care about the people that look like them, you get what I'm saying, and they like at the forefront of, you know, being an artist and like giving back to the community. That's what I like the most. Definitely. I've definitely seen a lot a lot of that too. Um so this new book. Well, we could talk for an hour about talk about the big book because now we're out of time. I mean, no, I was going to say, tell them where you, where you can buy it and, and all that kind of stuff. Said, and then don't forget to say the name and location and then you close out. Okay, okay um, Hip Hop Hip Hop Museum at the Sand Gallery. Right. All right. Talk Aaron so for one, bro, I just want to thank you for coming through and chopping it up with me. I definitely um, want everybody to go out and support his new project. Hummingbirds in the Trenches, um, why don't you tell them where, where they can pick that up as well as the rest of the merch. So um, Hummingbirds in the Trenches is available on Amazon.com. Uh, my merch is available on Conduani for them. Do it over again. So why don't you tell everybody where they can pick up a uh, copy of the book as well as the other merchandise. Okay, so Hummingbirds in the Trenches is available on Amazon.com and any of my re-merchandise is available at Conduani for 
Make sure you support this brother, man. Let's go out. Let's get these books. Let's get the rest of the, the merchandise that he has available. Let's book him to come out for more events. We definitely need to continue to support each other. I'm Aaron Maven. We're at the Sand Gallery, Hip Hop Art Museum. This is Art Talk. Thanks for joining us.